Welcome to Thursday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com as well as the mobile app. He's Paul Dottino. I'm Lance Meadow with you for the next 60 minutes as we'll continue to break down multiple prospects for the upcoming NFL draft and multiple ways to interact with us here on the program. You give us a ring, 201-939-4513. You can also hit us up on Twitter, hashtag Giants Chat. And as a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. So four schools on tap today, and let's start out in Big Ten country as we turn our attention to the Wisconsin Badgers and to break down Wisconsin's group of prospects. We bring in a man who's very familiar to the Giants organization. Why? Because he's suited up for Big Blue at center. Also a former Wisconsin offensive lineman, none other than Derek Engler, who you could hear on ESPN Radio in Madison. Derek, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dottino here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? Great, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on. You know, it's good to hear anybody from Big Blue Country. Uh, miss it <laughs> out there, you know, and we're, we're turning the corner here weather-wise. You know, we had about a foot of snow uh, a week or so ago, and now we're looking at 70s coming down the pike next week. So we're, we're finally getting rid of winter. It's good to hear you sounding better, Derek. Glad, glad for that. <laughs> <laughs> so how's everything going guys we're no we're about doing great today or what? absolutely and we are proud to announce not that you're losing sleep over this but we are turning the corner in terms of our weather as well so we can relate as we head more towards the 70s and the 80s but let's head to the prospects and i want to start derek with a position you know very well why because the giants right now have a question mark at center and joe tipman out of Wisconsin is somebody that is appealing. I guess my question is, from playing the position at 6'6", do you think he's too tall to assume the center spot at the NFL level? You know, he, I mean, first of all, he's a huge mauler. Uh, and, and this is a guy, uh, it, you're just your typical nasty, miserable, disgruntled old lineman. I mean, just he finishes to the echo of the whistle. You know, I think 6'6", 320. Um, you know, his pro day, I, I think he had like a 4'3 four, four, pro agility, which would have been faster than any old lineman at the combine. Um, yeah, I, I believe he ran a, an unbelievable 42. I think it was sub-5. I think it might have been a 4'9", um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, which is unbelievable for that size. Now, as far as the height and at that position, the center position, you know, I, I listen. You know, he's not. You know, you probably remember the names Travis Frederick, all pro at sure. with the Dallas Cowboys yep. late in the first round. The Cowboys, Jerry Jones took a lot of heat. He ran a five five forty. Didn't matter. He just was all pro every year uh, and had a great career down there. And then they went and drafted another center from the University of Wisconsin Badgers, and Tyler Biotic. Same type of body, mm-hmm. you know, that, that wide body, short, squatty. Uh, you know, Tip is a, a different story, obviously, at 6'6", six, six, but he is massive. I think he would be better suited at guard, but I think he could. With the right coaching and the right technique, I think he's athletic enough to understand and to be able to get that leverage to adapt at the pro level because he is so strong now. I mean, his back squat and, uh, and bench press are, are off the charts as well. Um, I, I, I think, again, with the right technique, he, he can bend, and, and he can understand the technique. It's not that much difference between a 6'6 six, six and a 6'4, guys. You know, right? I mean, let's mm-hmm. get real. I mean, I, I understand you. Look, everybody gets focused before the draft, of course, on numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, I think he could play center, guard, and even fill in a tackle. He's very versatile. Derek, I remember when you played here, and over the course of time, defensive tackles and nose tackles have taken on a little bit of a different role in today's NFL from at one time being really strong, powerful guys. Then you got the big, huge Butch Wolfolk uh, or Vince Wolfolk kind of nose tackle at 350 pounds lining up right over the center. And now today, you got a lot of these three techniques who are trying to slice and penetrate, and they're quick off the line. And, and I'm sensing, and, and you could tell me otherwise, that the, the, the guys that play opposite the center have kind of morphed a little bit over the years. And I wonder how much of a challenge is that going to be for Tipman as he makes it into the NFL? Yeah, 
you know, to a certain degree, um, I guess we got one of those uh, old school guys that also you guys might want to talk about in Keanu Benton, uh, the nose guard with mm-hmm. the Wisconsin yep. Badgers. Uh, his draft prospects have, uh, you know, rock, uh, skyrocketed since the Senior Bowl and 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 the Combine and so forth. But you know, and, and Pip had to go against Keanu every day, you know, and and he is kind of coming from the old school a little bit, okay. wide body, six four, uh, three twenty. You know, um, you know, and that, not necessarily the tons of fun that you know the Sam Adams, the Tony Syracuse's R.I.P. <laughs> the you know the. I mean, I'm going back to the, even the grave digger days. I mean, I, I mean, my knees almost broke. You know, going against that guy. Uh, you know, up in Green Bay, uh, and, and I just you know there those types of guys. Ted Washington, the largest sure. human being I've ever seen yep. in pads with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, and then his backup was Pat Williams. Those guys, mm-hmm. you're right. But those guys have, have not really, you don't see them as much. You see a, a, a few of them wreaking havoc, but you're right. I think they're, they're more about teaching, you know, they want quickness off the ball, hands, right? And, and um, I think the Badgers, I, I really think whoever drafts Keanu Benton is going to be very, very, very pleased. Um, I, just the way his work ethic has gone, he's really transformed himself um, as far as his body physique. He's looking better than he ever has, has the quick hands, has the explosiveness, obviously a, 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 a large body in the middle, too, at 6'4", 320. Um, but, yeah, I, I think as far as going back to tip, you know, that's something you learn. I mean, listen, any rookie, there's very few that can come into the league uh, and, and in the trenches and adapt to that speed right away. I mean, yeah. it's a, there's a learning curve there, of course. You know, and, and um, you know, I think, you know, you get those quick guys up the front, you know, on the other side of the ball and the D linemen, I mean, they're going to run into a, a wall, a very strong wall in Tipman. So, you know, I think, again, the same with Keanu Benton. I think, Tip, you know, he's going to um, – He's going to impress a lot of uh, uh, coaches out there, and I think he'll, his draft uh, status is going to continue to rise as well. And it helps having the, obviously, tradition and success of University of Wisconsin offensive linemen at, in the National Football League. As Follow-up well. question uh, with, with him, uh, Derek, because a lot of folks think that, that Schmitz out of uh, Minnesota is the number one center in this draft and that when you go to number two, Tipman is the name that most often comes up. A lot of people think second round, maybe maybe second round, possibly third round. From from what you've been able to ascertain, what is the value of Tipman around around the circles these days? Do you, do you suppose there's any chance he gets drafted before Schmitz? Uh, is there any talk about that at all that maybe his stock is rising? Ah, uh, funny you say that. Um, you know, I happen to be uh, you know friends and former teammates with his agent. Joe Panos, um, and you know, from what he's hearing, and the word is, is that there is a, a very strong possibility that he could sneak in to late first round, hmm. um, uh, definitely early second, uh, has been the word. So, you know, I think he impressed a lot of people. Uh, pro timing day was really good for him too. Uh, you know, I think. You know, who knows? The draft is, you know, it, it's crazy. It can go a lot of different directions. But I, I will tell you that there is all the scouts and GMs and coaches know this out there. When it comes to a Wisconsin offensive lineman, the, the, the resume is there. So you're not going to find very many busts in, in that unit coming out, you know, from Badgerland. And so I, I think, you know, they, they see the, the measurables on Joe Tipman. Um, they, they know w- – you know, obviously the school he's coming from, um, they know he's nasty. Like I said, right out the get-go, he, he is one of those just disgruntled old linemen that just doesn't care, wants to finish, finish, finish. And, and uh, you know, that's that's what you want. That's that's what you want right in the middle. Derek, this is a positional question because you come from the days when the shotgun snap was not the prevalent mode of, uh, of offense. Now today, everybody's in shotgun snap almost all the time. How difficult do you believe it is if, let's say, you're the Giants and you wind up not getting a center in this draft and you have to go with one of your in-house guys? They've got like six guys right now who they could line up and compete at left guard. And Joe Shane, the general manager, has even said, you know what? We don't know if we have to go get a center. We may have one of our internal candidates move over from left guard and one of those guys may wind up being our center. 
How challenging do you think that is in today's game? So, you know, I, I think it, it's, it, regardless of today's game, you know, I mean, you know, when I came in in 1997 as an undrafted free agent, they, basically what you said is what they were saying then, moving guys over from guard, you know, journeymen, that's not, because Brian Williams went down the second day of yep. training camp. With that you know, eye injury. All of a sudden, yeah, and all of a sudden, baptism by fire, you know, I'm thrown in there on the second, third day and running with the ones and some of the old names, you know, Rodney Hampton and, mm-hmm. and Howard Cross and those guys and, and Dave Brown. And, you know, I will tell you this, um, it, regardless, uh, just, you know, saying we got guys that can move, it, it, it's difficult. And then you throw in the mix of, of, of what where today's game is versus 25, you know, oh, God, we are almost, 20, you know, 23 years ago. Um, you know, it, it, it's it, it's very difficult because as, as a center, um, you know, especially if you're run blocking, shotgun snap, it ain't too easy. I mean, I, you know, I, when I had to do it, I hated it. You know, and, I, and coming out of Wisconsin, we never threw the ball back then especially. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, it, I think it's a, a very difficult transition uh, regardless, unless you have a guy that, you know, especially that you can draft that plays the position versus moving guys. Obviously, they're established in the league and veterans, but, you know, um, you know, just throw them at center. And I think the center position itself in, in the last uh, just decade uh, has become more valuable because of the transition of the game, in particular the passing game. And especially if you have a young quarterback, too, it helps to have a veteran as the anchor, as you can attest to, on the offensive line. You brought up Keanu Benton, and speaking of versatility, I think when it comes to evaluating Derek interior defensive linemen specifically in this day and age, we look for whether or not they can establish a consistent pass rush so that you're maybe not considering taking them off the field on third down. And Benton did have eight sacks in the last two seasons combined, but where do you see his ceiling and his growth, specifically as a pass rusher, where if you are willing to invest a relatively high pick on him, you don't even have to consider whether or not you're going to take him off the field? So that's where, and I I might have touched on this earlier, I really think the potential for him uh, once he... You know, once they get him at the next level, is I mean, the sky is the limit. I, I he just if you get, I mean, he passes the eye test. Let me tell you that, and and the effort and the work ethic is there, and you know he's done such a, a great job in the off season, um, just refining his body and his skills, especially his hands and ex, it's his uh, explosiveness, his quickness. Um, you know, I I actually he do like a larger. You know, going back to the days, too, Cornelius, Cornelius Griffin. I think mm-hmm. he was second round yeah. Giants, uh, sure thing. nose tackle. Yeah, Keanu Benton is a taller, bigger Cornelius Griffin. He's got the explosiveness, the quickness. Um, I, I really think he, the potential there, um, it wouldn't surprise me if Keanu goes in the second round, um, you know, because he, he had went from a, a mid third to fifth that, you know, he's done so well in the senior bowl and, and the combine and so on and, and, and pro day. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised to see him sneak in the late second. Um, and I, I think uh, uh, any franchise would be very pleased. Derek, before we let you go, one other player that I did want to ask about on the defensive side of the ball is linebacker Nick Herbig. Where do you see his fit at the next level? Considering you know, there's some questions about his length and where he may be able to squeeze in within this NFL puzzle. Well, you know, I. Uh, personally, uh, I know Nick very well. He interned with me last summer. Um, you, you, want, you want his character in the locker room, uh, first and foremost. Um, you know, I, I, I run internships every summer with, with a couple guys from, from the Badgers program, and he has been one of, one of the best I've ever come across as far as just true character. And, and I mean, it, it, again, work ethic, this is a guy that you, you'd have to drag him off. Um, I mean, he, and if you watch, this is one where you got to throw measurables out the window and just turn on the film with him. Mm-hmm. You really sure. do. Um, and, and, you know, I go back to, it's kind of the, the old adage with Wisconsin linebackers. I mean, look at Jack Sanborn. He was an undrafted free agent uh, uh, and, and was unbelievable for the Bears last year, ended up starting. Uh, you know, Leo Chanel, of course, is a great one, and the Chiefs pick him. You know, I can go on and on about Badger linebackers where it's the same conversation going in the draft. You know, it's the measurables, you know, length, this, that. I think 
you know, Nick, and of course the questions are going to come up about size, but if you turn on the film and see what he did against some of the best offensive linemen in the Big Ten, um, I think that, that the proof's in the pudding there. And I think he, I, I think he's eventually going to be, um, you know, a, a perennial starter in the league. Well, that's why we ask about key positions when it comes to Wisconsin because your program has a knack for producing some notable NFL stars as he is Derek Engler, former Wisconsin and Giants center. You can hear him on ESPN Radio Madison. Derek, always good hearing from you. We greatly appreciate the time and the insight and look forward to talking to you down the road. Be well, Derek. Thank you. Absolutely, guys. Enjoy the Easter weekend. Take care. You, you too. as well. Derek Engler with us here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. So we don't have to make a significant jump. Let's stay in Big Ten country <laughs> as we move from Wisconsin to Penn State. And to break down the Nittany Lions class, we now bring in their radio play-by-play announcer, Steve Jones. Steve, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dottino here on Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? Lance, Paul, it's really great to be with you. Everything going well here. Absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure having you on the program, and Penn State has a lot of substance heading into this draft, and let's start with arguably one of the best players in this entire class, and that is Joey Porter Jr., the son of former NFL great linebacker Joey Porter. You look at him on film, I mean, it's hard to find many weaknesses. The one thing, though, that I want to bring up, especially when we look at corners in the NFL, he was not a very opportunistic player, Steve. And I'm just curious, he had one interception in 2021. Why do you think that was a product of, and where do you think perhaps people should overlook that, that that should not be a concern at the NFL level? My running joke with Joey at practice was, in order to get interceptions, they have to throw the ball at you. <laughs> That's a good one. Sure. Yeah. Uh, look, I would say the weakness that he had two years ago was that I thought he was a little too handsy. I mean, I don't care whether it was a game or practice, you know, he, he, he was a little too handsy. He changed that last year. He only got called for one penalty last season, which involved use of hands. The only other one was a, was a penalty he got for a, a late hit on a, on a Michigan receiver. That's it. Uh, his length, his ability to use leverage, uh, his speed all play into the fact that he was a lockdown coverage corner uh, for Penn State all season long. And really, it's like been like that for a year and a half. But you, there's just certain things that he brings to the table that you're aching to have in a corner. And one of them is that length and that leverage and that natural coverability. All right. So universally, he seems to be one of the top three corners on everybody's draft board. But he doesn't seem to be number one on very many. He's either number two or number three by most people's recommendations. Steve, what do you think? How high should he go? In what order should these corners go? Um, I'm never really all that concerned about order. Last time I, 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 I looked at a sixth-round pick won seven Super Bowls, so I'm not really all that concerned about what, what order guys go in. I, he's definitely a top-20 pick. Uh, in, in my in my eyes, so no uh, way he I gets to the at. Giants at twenty five. In your opinion, I think it's all going to depend on, on what people want to pick in front of him and how many quarterbacks people want to pick. How about that? Yeah, uh, that's and that, that's a big that's a big part of it is the how how many quarterbacks get picked in front of him. There's no doubt. For example, I mean Brian knows him well. I mean, let's face it: this, uh, Christian Dable was here at Penn State all year, uh, right. so. <laughs> Uh, so, so Brian knows him really well, and he and he knows the Penn State system really well. And Joey Porter Jr. really thrived in Manny Diaz's system this past season, and and Manny Diaz's system really worked in part because he had Joey Porter Jr. When you have lockdown corners, you can then unleash the other nine guys yep. any way you wish. Sure. And Penn State had lockdown corners. Well, Steve, speaking of unleashing talent, the other thing that we always talk about when it comes to corners is, yeah, you want him to be able to lock down his receiver, but also if he can help stop the run, you know, that's the icing on the cake. And I've heard some speculation that maybe teams would toy with putting him a little bit at safety because of his ability to come down in the box and be aggressive and not shy away from that. What jumped out to you about his ability to help out in terms of the run defense? 
he was able to get in there, and he's a good form tackler, and he also anticipates really well. So he can get – now, everything he was doing was off the edge. So I did not watch Joey play in the box like Jair sure. Brown played in the box. I mean, Jair Brown, whomever gets him, is going to get a real gem here, in my opinion. But Joey, when you talk about playing in space, which he had to, that would mean open field tackling, whether he was trying to take on a running back or take on – a wide receiver. His open field tackling is outstanding, and that's a big plus. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about the connection to his dad with the NFL and, of course, the Pittsburgh Steelers (laughs) for those years. How influential is his father in Joey's career, uh, not just as a uh, mentor and as as a parent, but also in terms of as a football guy? Football guy, he's got a lot of the instincts that his father had, and obviously he knows how to play the game in part because of his father. And also when it comes to how the system works, taking the step of going into the combine, how to handle workouts going up to a combine, how to then handle the draft process. His father's lived it before. So that is a big help to a guy like Joey, and Joey doesn't have to worry about as much as that because he already has a father that can take him through the process and that makes a a big difference i will say this joey porter senior you know the years that joey porter jr was here joey porter senior would come around practice and he would just observe he never stood you know he never went out of his lane as a parent and Mm -hmm. i thought that was really impressive to both jack ham and me You brought up the name Jair Brown. Let's stay in the secondary. And this is a guy that was extremely opportunistic over the last two seasons. I mean, (laughs) he had six picks in 2021, which was the most by a Penn State player in 15 years. And earlier, you seem to be very high, Steve, on his versatility in terms of helping stop the run as well as obviously his hands. So where do you see his best fit on the NFL level in terms of where maybe secondary coaches could play into his skill set? Well, you look at, for example, take a guy like Nick Scott with the Rams, and he was a starter for the Rams in the Super Bowl when they won it over Cincinnati and how well he played. Nick Scott's an excellent athlete who then became a safety at Penn State. Jair Brown came in as a natural safety, and the guy that took him under his wing was Jaquan Brisker, who's now with the Chicago Bears. Mm -hmm. And that made a big difference. The two of them came up together through Lackawanna Community College. Then they both came here. Brisker was ahead of Jair in that, in that regard. This is a guy that looks at it, sees it, believes it, and doesn't hesitate on it because he believes it right away when he sees it. His ability also to get in the box and, and able to read, run, and make plays in the box, and then he became a really good blitzer here as well. So he really brings the full package to the table of a guy that is a very good athlete but also knows how to play football. You know what scares me, though, about him, Steve? He plays bigger than his frame. At only 5'11 yeah. and 203, he plays like a guy who should be 6'1". Yeah, you know what? He, yeah, you're right about that. Uh, and that's the difference. Brisker's a little bigger than he is. Uh, when you look at Brisker with the Bears, he's, he's, he's bigger than mm-hmm. Jair Brown. But, but you know what? I don't worry about that as much for this reason. If you know how to play, I'm not really going to get all concerned about whether you're five eleven and a half or six foot and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that really matters at that point. I think the, the league is looking for guys that can play the game and sit down in a film room and go, okay, you want me to do this, 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 and this, and then you go out to practice and he does this, this, and this, and then he gets into the game and he does this, this, and this, and that's what he does. He called out all the coverages of the secondary as well. He was the quarterback in that secondary for Penn State. So this is a guy that went into the game, and he had to know the other uh, positions on the field defensively to make a big difference as to what coverage Penn State was in and what they should be, uh, be going with. Steve, let's move to the offensive side of the ball. Parker Washington, also a guy yeah. that has been questioned about his size, but there's no doubt about it. His production is there. I'm interested to hear his path throughout the course of his Penn State career because he started out as a pure slot guy, but it seems as if last season they gave him about a quarter of the snaps on the outside. How did he fare on the outside, and how much do you think he proved that if a team does draft him, he's not just a lone slot guy. There's more to his game. 
Yep, you know, take the Ohio State film from last season, rack that up, and that will give you all the answers you need. Uh, <laughs> because he, he had 179 yards receiving. I know the game, game you're talking against about. Ohio State. It yep. was just a phenomenal game. And what they do in the Penn State system is they try to get everybody to learn all three spots at that wide receiver area. So, yeah, he started out as a slot guy, but then they started moving guys around. That way you don't give the same look to the defense every time. That's why, for example, you know, eventually next year we'll talk more about Penn State linebackers. But they end up learning all three spots while they're here. And that, that just makes a difference in terms of the versatility it gives the guy. He is, does a good job of getting off the jam at the line of scrimmage when he's at the wideout spot, something he doesn't have to worry as much when he's in the slot. He's a really good route runner and has just fabulous hands. Mm-hmm. They don't doubt about that. Hey, Steve, let me ask you this. We know that Brian Dable's son, as you mentioned earlier, uh, was uh, with Penn State, and now he is here with the Giants on the uh, on the staff. Are there guys that you think who we're not talking about yet on Penn State who may be a sleeper that uh, maybe uh, – you know, Brian Sun will say, hey, Dad, uh, poke him in the ribs a little bit and say, uh, hey, I, I got a guy for you. <laughs> but nobody's talking about it, but I got a guy for you, and I think he can help the team. P.J. Mustafer is a guy that comes to my mind right away as a guy that you're going to look at. And uh, he overcame a really hard knee injury uh, in his junior year, fought all the way back, got better and better as time went. This guy's a good defensive tackle. He's not a first or second day pick. I mean, you're talking about in the third day, but you, you know, you will end up with a guy that is a real leader that knows how to play the game. Just like his brother, Sam, who played, who's played most of his career with the bears at center has played. So he understands the league and he knows what it takes a guy like that. And then let's go into the free agent realm. All right. I don't know how the giants are set at long snapper, but there's a kid named Chris Stahl here who is, uh, who won the Patrick Manley Award as the nation's long snapper. And Manley, when they do that award, they literally take the nominees and go through every snap. Like, they don't just, like, sit there and go, hey, what do you guys think? No, right. they go through every snap and they pick it out. This is a guy that he'll be a free agent. I'd get him into a camp, take a long, hard look at it, because we all know after watching the Bengals game in the opener last year with, with the Steelers, a good long snapper is darn good. <laughs> sure. Well, Casey Kreider, who is their long snapper, he just re-signed. I understand you're a Penn State guy. He's an Iowa guy, so you're not looking out for him. It's understandable. <laughs> trying but, to take you know, his job. <laughs> if he was listening to this program, you may have a little bit of beef with him. I understand you can't root for another Big Ten team. It's okay, but... Get you know. him, get him under the roof. Put yeah. him on the practice squad for a year. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Indeed. Hey, okay. Steve, before you okay. before you go, before you go though, Juice Scruggs. The Penn State yes. center, who I know has gotten some ink. Could you talk about his pro potential? Because we know the Giants are thin at center right now. Uh, what what kind of plug-and-play possibilities does he have, if any at all? Well, let's start with this. He can play the three inside spots. He played both guard and center here at Penn State. So uh, and, and he started at both guard and center here at Penn State. And you know how much in the NFL they value versatility mm-hmm. yep. with offensive linemen. And that's what he'll be able to do. This is a – he overcame a lot. He had a terrible car accident three, four years ago where his weight got way down after the accident. And he built himself back up into this and became himself a powerful force in the offensive line for Penn State. He was the quarterback of that offensive line, and when he was a guard, he'll pull out. You get him into open field. This is a good athlete out there running it better than 300 pounds. And you can pull him, and Penn State pulled him as a center as well in the old Kevin Mawai tradition. Mm-hmm. Okay, I know I just went, I just went across the parking lot. No, 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 hey, no, that's no listen, right. hey, we, can, we understand who you're referring and, to. And by the way, the Giants are not afraid to do that within their scheme <laughs> either. Steve, if I, if I had a multiple hands to tell you how many former Jets are now on the Giants roster, it just goes to yeah, show I you. Oh, yeah. oh, I know. Oh, believe me. As a lifelong follow the Giants guy, which I have been. <laughs> okay, I know. <laughs> sure. But that's, yep. what, but that's what he can do. You can put that guy at center, he'll play it head up on you, or you can pull him out in the open field and he'll make plays, and he can do the same thing at guard. He is Steve Jones, the radio play-by-play announcer for Penn State. Steve, greatly appreciate the time and the inside, and very much look forward to talking down the road. Thanks for hopping on the program. Thanks, Steve. Hey, guys, a lot of fun. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Some great intel from 
Steve, on what to expect from this Penn State class. And he mentioned a few perhaps under-the-radar players. And remember, the Giants have had a great deal of success with undrafted free agents. So we want to focus on the guys that are going to go in the early rounds, but we're also not going to dismiss players that could join the team as undrafted free agents. So I think we covered enough in terms of Big Ten land. Let's now move (laughs) into SEC territory as we now turn our attention to Mississippi State, the Bulldogs. And to break down their class, we are now joined by Stefan Kreischnick, beat writer for the Clarion Ledger. Stefan, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dottino here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hope all is well. Thanks for joining us. How's everything on your end? Yeah, everything's going well, man. It's uh, full-blown baseball season here in Starkville, but I uh, obviously love talking football and, and talking about you know the upcoming draft with y'all. Absolutely, and we should mention to our audience, Stefan has his hands full because he does not pick a specific sport, right? You're all over the place when it comes to Mississippi State <laughs> athletics. There is no end of the season. There's no off season. He goes from one sport to another. So we can relate. We understand, but we're glad that we're at least able to get your mind back on football. And we've been focusing a lot on this cornerback class in Mississippi State clearly has one of them in Emmanuel Forbes, who was extremely opportunistic to find the FBS record with not one, not two, but six pick sixes. So what is it about the fact that he seems to always have a knack to get into the passing lane and take it the other way and make those disruptive plays. What is so appealing about his skill set in that department? Yeah, I think what's, what's interesting, and, and you probably see it with a lot of athletes that you know come from, from the state, is you know in high schools in Mississippi, you see a lot of multi-sport athletes. You see a lot of athletes who play on both sides of the ball when they play football, and I think that's what you're seeing with Emmanuel Forbes is you know, a lot of the various skill sets that he learned you know, as a, as a young football player, carried over to the collegiate level. And it's why, you know, not only is a good cornerback when, when it comes to coverage and, and, you know, covering receivers, but when he gets the ball in his hands, man, he looks like a wide receiver when, when he's bringing it back. He's really hard to tackle. He finds holes. He finds the right block. And, and I think a lot of that stems from, you know, who he was as, as a young football player. And it, and it really has made him, like you said, I think opportunistic was a great word of, of that. He, he makes some plays where, where you're just sitting there wondering, man, it, you love to have a corner like that, right? You know, I think the the issue for me as I, as I look at him is that he plays bigger than his six one one sixty six because soaking wet that's like a box of Kleenex tissues, <laughs> and and what what what's troublesome is he has such good cover skills and he and he attacks and he's got anticipation and he's not afraid to mix it up, but at at one sixty six with a pipe cleaner type of frame. I just wonder how is he going to be able to deal with these guys at the NFL level? Yeah, I think it's the, it's the number one thing that's you know being discussed. I think if if he was bigger and, and he put up the type of numbers he did in the SEC, I think he would be a surefire you know first round pick. I think that's what you know has some teams hesitant. It's what's been talked about you know at, at the combine and at pro day in regards to him. And you know he said that he, he doesn't think it should be a problem. And I think what what is interesting, one thing that he's pointed out is you know when you look at the SEC, it's probably the closest thing you have to the NFL in terms of the collegiate game, right? Sure. And, and, and in terms of the athletes that you're playing against. And he only missed one game in his career, and it was a non-football-related injury. And he thinks that's, that's something that, you know, GMs and, and coaches should, you know, look at it and pay attention to is, yeah, he's, he's smaller than a lot of guys at his position. He's played against some big guys, but it hasn't really resulted an injury concern. So I think that's one thing that, that's interesting to see, you know, if, if that's something that teams look at. Well, the length says he can play boundary. He doesn't have to be a slot guy. And he certainly has the ability, probably technically, to play inside or outside. But again, when you're talking about the, the weight and the frame, I don't know that he's going to be able to play on the boundary because there are going to be a lot of receivers bigger than him that are going to muscle him on 50-50 balls, aren't they? Yeah, no, I, I think so. I think that's, that's where concern is. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, in the SEC, he has gone against some of the, the best receivers and some guys that have translated. I mean, you look at a guy like Devontae Smith, he's covered him too, but, you know, Devontae's also not – not the biggest right. guy, right? So yep. it will be interesting to, to see him go against, you know, some guys on the outside, some really big receivers in the NFL and see how he matches up. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be something that I think right away, you know, early in his career, teams are going to try to go at him and try to exploit. Um, I am interested to see, you know, one thing with him is when he gets in an NFL weight room, you know, are they going to be able to, you know, put some pounds on him? Can that change? But then you also look at his game and, and what he's able to do. Do you want to change his size? Do you want to make him play? Is that going to shift his – his game at all so it, it really is an interesting dynamic that you know i think has teams you know in the balance of how comfortable they are taking him early on 
Well, Stefan, you have to understand, Paul also questioned Devontae Smith and whether or not he could hold up. So, you see, he <laughs> wants to put as much meat and potatoes on these guys as humanly possible. So, listen, if you could change the meal plan in Starksville, you get on top of that. You know, this way we won't have to ask these questions on a continuous no doubt. basis. No doubt. But in all seriousness— listen. One of the things that also I think is notable, you talked about the durability, which I think is a key component. Hey, he's staying on the field. But also, when you have a corner that can maybe assist in the run aspect on defense, that to me is another indicator that maybe he could hold up. So how did he fare when they asked him to chip in in stopping the run? He did He did really well. I was talking to someone uh, a few weeks ago actually about him and his tackling. I mean, he's got some pretty good tackling considering his – his size and, and being a corner, he, he's really not bad at tackling in, in open space. Um, along with the run game, he's, he's found his way, you know, putting some pressure and, and getting into the backfield and, and uh, affecting quarterbacks, too. I, I think, you know, he, he has the, the talent to do so. Now, how teams look to use him, that'll obviously depend on, on the defense that he's in. You know, at Mississippi State, they ran a three three five, So, you know, he didn't really come too much into the backfield just because of how much they would assign and, and bring pressure. He, he wasn't really forced to help you know, too much in the running game. But but at the same time, when, when he did have the opportunities, you know, he was a, a sure, you know, surefire tackler. He, he was a strong tackler, um, and, and he did kind of what was asked of him when, when those situations came about. And I will say, too, with the, the diet you guys are talking about in Starkville, I'll tell you what, with, with the, the type of food that they got down here, it's, it's pretty impressive that he was able to stay below 170. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point, sure. <laughs> they got the good press box fair, huh? <laughs> yeah. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Let me ask you about one other guy who, who's a bit intriguing to me, Cameron Young, uh, the defensive tackle. They list him at 6'3", 304, with, with arms of over 34 inches. So certainly he's got some tools there that could be useful to an NFL team, although I don't necessarily think he's going to help right away. I'm thinking day three could be a guy who might be some uh, developmental kind of player. Yeah, I, I, that's, I think, the, the number two prospect, I think, when it comes to Mississippi State players. I think Forbes is, is kind of that top guy. And, and Cam Young, like you said, probably a day three guy. Um, you know, I talked to, a, and I know the, 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 the call you guys had before me also mentioned the Jets, so I hate to bring up the Jets as well. But I talked All to good. A, <laughs> a, a scout, uh, you know, last you know fall camp when, when they were down here. And, you know, I asked, hey, you know, who from Mississippi State kind of kind of sticks out to you as an NFL prospect outside of the obvious players? And, and right away he said Cam Young because he saw, you know, that athleticism mixed with mm-hmm. that size. It, he looks like a guy where you put him in the middle of that defensive line and, and he's going to stuff any any running game there is, right? I mean, you look at some of the best D tackles that, in the NFL and, you know, you, you don't have to be the biggest guy, you don't have to be the fast guy, but you, you get in there and, and you stuff that run game, it can really change the defense. And I think that's a guy that a few years from now you could end up looking back and saying, hey, you know, this team that, that drafted him has a really good run defense. Why is that? Well, they took this guy late in the draft and really developed him and made him fit. You know, their defensive scheme. He has all the tools to, to really be that mm-hmm. type of guy in the run game. Sure, and with NFL teams rotating defensive linemen, even if he's a two-down type of defensive lineman, there's still value to have a guy like that on the depth chart. So your point is well taken. Stefan, speaking of you having a conversation with a Jet scout, my final question is they have several other players who are perhaps projected as undrafted free agents. Anybody under the radar in your mind outside of the two that we already talked about that – could maybe latch on with a team or maybe is just scratching the potential of what they could bring to the NFL? Yeah, I think there's there's two guys on the defensive side that, that kind of stand out to me. The first is Jalen Green. He played safety, you know, when he transferred to Mississippi State. He originally started as a corner at Texas. He's not the not the biggest guy, not the fastest guy. His numbers don't really pop, you know, at the at the pro day that, that they had here. Um, but when you look at the guy like that who's played, you know, at the Big 12 and the SEC level and has played multiple positions, is is that a guy that maybe is undrafted and teams say, hey, we'll bring him in and see if we can really hone in on corner or hone in on safety. But he, he's versatile, right? You like to have a guy, you know, that, that you take undrafted that can kind of mix and match it and go in different spots as your team kind of needs it. So he, he's a guy to keep an eye on. Another one is Jackie Matthews. He kind of played that, you know, that, that hybrid safety role at Mississippi State. Um, a quick guy, kind of like Forbes, has a good knack for the ball, but also can get into the backfield and really, you know, create some havoc. He's kind of on, he's on the shorter end, you know, like, like Forbes there are. You know, when it comes to size and, and weight, there are some, you know, concerns with his game. That's probably why he, he won't be a guy that, that gets drafted. But, you know, as an undrafted guy, like like I said earlier, he's versatile as well. can kind of do, you know, multiple roles in the secondary. Is that a guy that seems to, hey, it's worth a shot on seeing if we could develop him and see if, you know, that size ends up not being too much of an issue. Stefan, I'm going to ask you to go into your memory banks for just a second. Turn back the clock, if you can, one year. 
And Makai Polk is coming out of Mississippi State after playing there for just one season as a transfer. He's in the Giants' room right now. He was on the practice squad last year. They picked him up as a free agent. He's 6'3". He's got size. He's got length. Not necessarily burner speed, but had 1,000 yards in his one year at Mississippi State. The Giants are still trying to figure out how they can enhance their wide receiver room. Is this a guy that we should not be sleeping on? Is there something there that maybe all of a sudden is going to rear its head during training camp this year and we're going to say, wow, maybe maybe Polk was the guy in the room all along that could help this team out? Yeah, and, and the reason I think that is because, you know, when he did declare for the draft last year, I think caught people off guard because he's a guy that I think, you know, and I still think probably would have benefited from another year being in an SEC weight room and getting some more experience. I think he came out a little early, and that's why I think now – Maybe as he gets, you know, a couple of years into his NFL experience, he, he might be ready to, to turn that corner a bit and start seeing some more playing time. I mean, uh, his numbers were outstanding. Over 100 receptions broke the Mississippi State record. Obviously, that's a result of Mike Leach and, and his air raid offense. But at the same time, when you look at receivers in the past, and Mike Leach's air raid offense who haven't even put up those type of numbers, right? So he, he has the ability on the outside to really go up and, and catch a 50-50 ball. I think for him it was just a matter of, he needs to get in the weight room a bit, get his size up a little bit, and then he has a chance to, to be a guy that's maybe a, a number three receiver, number two receiver you know, for an NFL team like, like the Giants. I'm really interested to see what he looks like this year coming up in the preseason and whatnot and training camp, see where his size, how much he's grown you know, off the field in the weight room um, to see if he's really ready to, to make that jump. Because I think you know, his rookie year, a lot of it you know, had to be focused on getting him in the size and the strength to play at that level. Sure. Well, he's got the height, at least, that's appealing to the Giants' receiving core because they have a number of smaller guys who are shifty, so he could differentiate himself from that standpoint. And there's certainly competition on the back end, so that is a player to watch who already is on the Giants' roster. Maybe there will be another Mississippi State Bulldog in the near future. (laughs) Who knows? He is Stefan Krasnick, beat writer for Mississippi State. For the Clarion Ledger, Stefan, greatly appreciate the time and the insight. Enjoy baseball season as well as the food down there, and we look forward to talking down the road. Take care. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. You got it. Our pleasure. So that is a breakdown of Mississippi State. We have one last program that we're going to put onto the microscope as we will then reflect on all of these prospects and maybe try to squeeze in a phone call or two at 201-939-4513 as we move along here on Thursday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. And we are now going to turn our attention to the North Carolina Tar Heels, the latest stop on our tour here through the draft prospect land. And remember, North Carolina was a program, Paul, that made quite the presence in the 2022 draft class because the Giants wound up grabbing a pair of offensive Mm -hmm. linemen. So something tells me they're well read up on their oh, Tar Heels. Don't forget Tamon Fox. True. The yeah. linebacker well, who showed some player. flashes. Correct, yeah. Well, that's why I said you could go even beyond mm-hmm. the guys that were drafted, but with Josh Azudu and Marcus McKeithen, who is a player that people should not overlook because, unfortunately, he was hurt for all of last season. Could be somebody that battles on the offensive line as they look to continue to round out the depth chart in that department. So, for more on this year's crop of prospects coming out of North Carolina... We bring in Ross Martin, editor of Inside Carolina. Ross, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dettino here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hope Paul is well. How's everything on your end? It's good. I'm actually driving down to the Masters. So wow. It's good on my side. You are really <laughs> balancing everything over Enjoy. the of these next few days. Well, thanks for the time. Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate you squeezing us in before you make your way to Augusta as the world of golf continues to move along here simultaneously with the NFL draft. And let's start at the wide receiver position, a position actually we were just talking about with respect to Mississippi State. Josh Downs is one of the appealing players at that position. He's got a track background, and that's why it's no surprise that we saw that elite speed on full display in Carolina. But when it comes to where he may fit, slot wide receiver, outside guy, he's not a guy with a huge amount of size. So where do you see him maybe being able to branch out? Is he just a slot guy, or is there more to his game that he can get out of that frame? The thing about Josh Downs is he's a a very precise and elite route runner. He spent most of his time uh, in the slot at UNC, 
He can bump outside, but like you said, his limitations are size. He, he is small. I mean, he is 5'9", 5'10", um, slight. Um, but, you know, w- with that small size, he has speed, he has quickness, he has precision. He came to UNC very polished. He's gotten better every year. He's had some great quarterbacks as well. Tar Heels with Sam Howe uh, in 2021 and Drake May in 22. Um, but, I mean, I think he has all the tools you're looking for in a smaller, quicker, you know, cross the middle slot type guy. Um, and he's a super athlete. It's just the size is what I think uh, will move him and drop him down a little bit farther than some of the kind of elite, you know, wide receiver one type players. For folks who don't know, Downs, uh, in his last two seasons, 101 catches for 1,300 yards, 94 for 1,000. So how did teams try to defend him? Did they try to beat him up with press coverage and jams? Did they try to give him a little bit of cushion? Did they zone him? Did they double him? Did they bracket him? How, how did they try to make it happen? Because it obviously did not work. <laughs> Yeah, he always talked about being bracketed, and that's what Drake May said a lot in 2022. Uh, he would get double teamed, they'd bring the safety along with the corner, double team him. So, yeah, despite that, I mean, he was getting double teamed probably both seasons. He was still very, very productive. Two time, first team, all ACC wide. The touchdowns are there, yards after catch. Uh, he returned punts for UNC for two seasons as well, so he can help you out on special teams. Um, and, I mean, zero character issues. Son of a coach, ETSU, East Tennessee State. Um, he's also the nephew of Dre Bly, the Tar Heel legend. Mm-hmm. So he has kind of the lineage there as well. I mean, it's been all football. And his, his brother is a, uh, a big-time safety, I think a freshman at Alabama, Caleb Downs, a big five-star, top-ten recruit type type uh, player there. So it's a family of athletes and ballers <laughs> um, for Josh Downs. So. Uh, I expect him to have a, a really nice NFL career. Uh, I think he really helped the team on offense to be kind of a number two, uh, number two, number three guy for a team for a long time. So apparently the gene pool is alive and well within the Downs family is what you're saying. A lot of athletes coming out of that side of things. The other thing that's appealing to me, Ross, about his upside in the NFL is the fact that he was a punt returner for the last two seasons. And, you know, when you bring in a young wide receiver, maybe you don't play them immediately on offense, but they can contribute on special teams. How much of a difference maker was he in that department? And how much do you see that continuing on the NFL level? Yeah, I think he can certainly return punts in the NFL. Now, he never took one back for a touchdown. I don't remember too many long plays. Um, you know, but the, the, what's the first thing you think about with punt returns? You got to secure the ball. Yep. I don't remember any fumbles from his side. Um, I feel like the special teams and kickoffs and punt returns just kind of changed. You don't see many explosive plays anymore um, from college. I remember Ryan Switzer at UNC returned like yep. five or six as a freshman, uh, set, set a record there. But Josh Downs was solid, nothing super flashy, but I mean, he has that quickness, he has that short. You know, short space, short time, uh, quickness there. Uh, very shaky, very uh, versatile as a as an athlete. So yeah, I mean, I think he can certainly return punts or kicks uh, at the NFL level. I need to ask you about his uh, wide receiver teammate because I'm thinking that somebody is going to get a good value late on day three with him. Maybe he'll be an undrafted free agent. I don't know, but Antoine Green, who goes six two, six three, over two hundred pounds. I'm looking at his five years that he spent at North Carolina, and I'm, I'm looking at 19 yards a catch. I'm looking at 15 touchdowns in, what, uh, 34 games. Uh, that's some pretty big-time playmaking ability. And I know he doesn't have necessarily the uh, stats uh, in terms of physical tools that say he's going to be an outstanding player and needs to be drafted early. But what, what do you think about him being a sleeper for somebody? Yeah, I mean – Antoine Green is a is your classic deep threat. Um, he's not, you know, your number one across the middle, big time. I mean, he's he's six three. He's not huge. Maybe uh, probably two hundred pounds, two ten is probably where he's listed. Um, but you know, he has that track speed. Really good at tracking the ball on deep routes. Um, like you said, you know, his, his yards per catch were high because he connected and had really good uh, deep throw quarterbacks with Sam Howell and Drake May. Uh, struggled with injuries 
throughout his career. Mm. So he overcome, he overcame that. He was hurt as a freshman. Um, you know, had five, he was played five years at USC. So I mean, a couple of those years he was struggling with injuries. Got hurt last year as well um, and missed a couple games. But he was productive. I mean, he is an outside receiver. Um, beat, beat your guy and catch the pass over the shoulder. Great kid. Um, overcame a lot of adversity, I think, which can, you know, those guys are mentally tough, and I think that can kind of help you. And he was healthy for the, for the majority of, of his last season uh, as well. A pretty big high recruit. I know he was a track athlete as well with great speed. Um, you know, but I do see him, yeah, later rounds, you know, fourth, fifth option on a team, um, you know, runs the verticals from the outside is kind of how he fits in. But he's – uh, I've seen him kind of crawl up some mock drafts pretty recently. Well, Ross, last season, as we were talking about before we had you on, the Giants clearly liked themselves some North Carolina offensive linemen based on the fact that they drafted a pair. And the Tar Heels have another offensive lineman who's projected to perhaps be a late-round pick, and that is Awesome Richards, left tackle. What's appealing about him, and where do you see him fitting in in the NFL? He's gotten better every year. Um, came in pretty raw. He started three seasons at left tackle. He is not your quintessential, like, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, left tackle. He's 6'4", six, 6'4 four, six, four and a half. Um, you know, he's big. He has, you know, he has length, but he's not, like, massive. So, I, talking to him at Pro Day uh, two weeks ago, you know, he said teams like him at guard some, even some center, uh, but he never played that at UNC. So, it'll be interesting to see – uh, whether, you know, in, in the NFL he plays in the inside or outside of right guard or left guard. Um, again, a great kid, basketball player in high school. Um, and just he, he got better and better and better. And by his final season at UNC in 2022, man, he, I think he allowed like, you know, it was he was not allowing any, any sort of sacks, any sort of pressures. It was some elite level left tackle play. So I think he, um, you know, I think he's solid. I don't think he's an elite left tackle prospect, obviously, but I think he could be a third, fourth round pick for a team that needs uh, some depth. Uh, and it's interesting to see it where he plays. I think because I never saw him play at guard. You know, he's not a big, bulky guy. He's just a, a solid six four and a, and a half, three hundred, three fifteen type uh, type tackle. I got to ask you about a guy who's a to me a sub linebacker who's going to cover because he's got length and he's got the ability and the agility to do it. Noah Taylor checking in at 6'4", 238 pounds. Now, some people would say, wow, that guy must be an edge rusher. He's going to be blitzing and getting to the quarterback. Well, he comes over from Virginia and plays this one year at North Carolina, and, and I just see a guy who's got a lot of coverage skills. And right now in the NFL, guys who have length and can cover people, whether it's tight ends or running backs, they can be valuable. Yeah, so he played, I think, more linebacker at Virginia than he played at UNC. At UNC, he played this position called Jack, which is essentially a defensive end, right. uh, edge rusher, and a little bit of outside linebacker hybrid. He did drop into coverage, but not too much. But I think he can, based on kind of what he played at Virginia. Um, he's not he's not huge. Like, he's not a pure, you know, freak defensive end. He does have that kind of athleticism and versatility to play a little outside linebacker that can rush the passer. I think pass rushing is one of his strengths. You know, he is a mature five-year player. He got injured um, and missed the second half of the season. So at pro day, he, didn't, he wasn't able to work out. I think also at the combine, he wasn't working out. He only did bench press at UNC's pro day. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if he gets drafted. You know, he, he does kind of remind me of Taman Fox. Um, you know, kind of same build. Taman may be a little bit bigger. I covered Taman's recruitment. I mean, I, that guy was – I knew him for six, seven years. Um, so I see them pretty similar. Uh, Noah Taylor may be a little bit more of a versatile outside linebacker like you alluded to. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if someone takes a flyer on him in the seventh round or if he's more of a, a free agent pickup. Uh, after the draft uh, All right. concludes. We got to hit the rewind button. You mentioned you covered Fox, and you know him really well. What's his upside? Because he flashed in some spot duty for the Giants last year, especially as a pass rusher. Yeah, I mean, pass rushing is his, is his thing. I think, you know, he doesn't have that really explosive burst that I think, you know, is the quintessential 
uh, outside linebacker, defensive end, like just that pure freak athleticism. But he's smart kid, good kid. Yeah. Um, I th- he hold, he's top five in sacks, I think, at UNC. I remember him passing Lawrence Taylor, another Giants mm-hmm. uh, legend, obviously. Yeah, we heard it's of him. Funny that was, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, people always forget he went to UNC. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Tamon Fox, man, great kid. Uh, I think he's just steady, right? I mean, I, I it was – I think I read something where he was the only undrafted player to uh, – do something with the Giants this season. Yeah. So um, I think just, just the fact that he is a solid, steady player, experienced, smart, that will that'll keep him in the league for a while. And I'm, I'm happy to see him have some success early on in the NFL because he's a great kid. His brother is um, is an interior lineman for UNC right now, Tamari Fox. Oh, wow. So there you go. Maybe multiple Foxes on the Giants roster. Who knows? Well, I'm glad you brought up the offensive line, Ross, because that's where I want to end before we let you go. And we talked about the Giants invested in a number of them. They have an opening at center. And Joshua Zudu, who pretty much played everywhere at North Carolina, the one area, though, he wasn't utilized much was at center. I remember I spoke with Mac Brown last year after the Giants drafted him, and he mentioned that because of the stuttering issue, that was one of the reasons they were concerned, the communication. From what you saw, though, how much do you think Azudu could be an option if the Giants wanted to experiment with him at center? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not an offensive line guru. I like him more at guard. Just the athleticism in space. I mean, they always called him a dancing bear. Just kind of yes. get out in space. I've heard that. Lead, kind of lead, you know, pull and lead the blocks. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what offense Giants run, but, you know, he is a, kind of an athletic freak for an offensive lineman. So I think having that at guard um, is beneficial. I mean, I never saw him play center. I, I don't – Sure. You know, he's, he's athletic, so he could probably do a lot of things. But I know that snapping the ball is, is something that's not easy and it, you kind of, it's not something you can pick up. So I like him staying at guard. Uh, you know, he played some tackle at UNC too. So he was a, he was very versatile, um, and it's also good to see him have success at that level. I mean, he was he was talented. I, I think a lot of UNC fans wish he came back for his final year. Well, you can never have enough versatility on the offensive line because of the injury bug, and the Giants absolutely tapped into his skill set, and hopefully he can hold up and stay fully healthy for the upcoming campaign as he will likely be an option at left guard. He is Ross Martin, editor of Inside Carolina, all over the Tar Heels. Ross, greatly appreciate the time and the insight. Enjoy the Masters, and we look forward to chatting with you down the road. Thank you. All right, appreciate it, guys. You got it. Our pleasure. As that will wrap up our marathon through the college landscape, we hit on multiple schools, two from the Big Ten, Mississippi State and North Carolina. And you wonder, Paul, before we wrap up shop here on the program, because, I mean, this goes back to Brian Dable's ties to Penn State with his right. son working there. When you're Joe Shane and the coaching staff, if you invested so much in North Carolina prospects last season, does that give you a reason to further look into that class a little bit more closely? Because, listen, I think part of it is they respect the heck out of Mac Brown. Yes, they Given do. how many years he's coached in college, and they know he can produce NFL talent. But when you have a trust factor with a program because of the coaching staff, I do think that gives you a reason to then turn back, especially if you think there's some substance there well, the next year around. I mean, I would say I think there's definitely going to be some connection when you look at Penn State's schedule and see where Brian's – uh, son yep. had worked on certain teams and certain players while he was at Penn State. I think that connection is probably going to be extremely valuable because his son was on that staff. He was in the film room. He was in the game plan room. He knows how they were looking at players' strengths and weaknesses as they were trying to win ball games. Now, what he won't know is the character issues on other programs that Penn State played. But what he will know are the strengths and weaknesses that they're looking at on tape. Yeah. And he may be able to cross-check somebody and say, look, I know you said such and such a guy can't or cannot do this. When we were going to play them at Penn State and we looked at three films, go back and check those because this is what we found out. That could be very helpful. It's great to get the perspective, whether or not there's a lot of meat on the bone there, of somebody who prepared for that opponent. That's Just my because, point. once again, you get a different perspective. No doubt. And I'm sure that's part of the conversation going on within the scouting room as well as the 
personnel department as they gear up for the 2023 NFL Draft. few reminders before we close up shop here on BBKL, the Giants Huddle podcast. You could check that out on the Giants app as well as Giants.com slash podcast. Also, Giants fans, you can take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2023 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And the Giants' official connected TV streaming app is Giants TV. It brings you original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV, it's free. It's on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, as well as the Giants mobile app. So we will have a program on Friday. It is taped as we will continue to preview the NFL draft. We have four schools that we put under the microscope. So tune into that as you will continue to get a great deal of intel from a variety of individuals who cover these programs from across the country. We appreciate everybody tuning in for today's episode, which is part of the Giants platforms everywhere and Giants.com slash podcast. For Paul Dottino, I'm Lance Meadows. Stay locked to Giants.com for all the latest, and we'll speak to you tomorrow with a taped edition. We'll still be here, alive and well, right here (laughs) on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Have a good one.